I was not the original speaker for this particular lecture. There was an international speaker who was expected to speak on this topic, but unfortunately he could not make it, so at the last moment I have been assigned this task to do. Now we all know that lipid profile is a very important investigation that we do every day in our clinical practice. And it is seminally important to understand the individual fractions of lipid panel. But my focus today would be more on lipoprotein little a, which is assuming great clinical significance over the last few decades. This is a very famous study called Interheart Study. And we know that coronary artery disease and cerebrovascular disease are the biggest killers in the world. And out of various risk factors that we talk about, abnormalities in lipid profile are at the top so far as the causative factors are concerned. And if we do appreciate this in presence of all other important risk factors, it is really important that we critically understand the importance of individual components of lipid profile. Now, when you look at the individual fractions of lipid panel, on the x-axis, what you see is the increasing size of these particles. And on the y-axis, it is just in the reverse order. In fact, the more dense a particle, it's at the bottom. So you would see the numbers are in reverse order, not in the usual order of increasing upwards. It is decreasing up like that. So when we look at this, what we clearly understand that HDL, the high-density lipoprotein, has the smallest size, but has the highest density. And this is supposed to be extremely protective so far as the cardiovascular diseases are concerned. On the other hand, when the size increases, we have the LDL, the IDL, the triglycerides, chylomicrons, and so on and so forth. Within the LDL cholesterol, it is the density of the LDL cholesterol which is vitally important, and it's not the size which is important. And it's important to appreciate that if you have a lot of LDL in the system, but if the particle size is big, they are large and buoyant particles, they are not as much injurious to the vascular endothelium as the small, dense LDL particles are. And this is very important to understand. A new terminology which has come up over the last one decade is non-HDL cholesterol, which is simply when you take away the HDL cholesterol from the total cholesterol, and I will allude to this very important issue today because this has become a therapeutic target. And when we talk about this non-HDL cholesterol, it actually includes particles like LDL, IDL, triglyceride, VLDL, and all of them put together, and that is a very important target for treatment. So when you do the blood test for a lipid profile, what you are looking at is the total cholesterol, the HDL cholesterol, the triglycerides, and the various LDL, VLDL, triglycerides, and now much better labs are also giving lipoprotein little a. What about the apolipoprotein A and apolipoprotein B? These are the particles which actually combine with the lipid particles, and they help in the trans transfer of these molecules into the individual cells and individual tissues. So they are extremely important. For a clinician, all these nuances of science may become very difficult. And therefore, it is important for us to have some image which will make us understand what exactly APOA1 and APOB, et cetera, mean to us, and we are all clinicians. So when we look at these lipoproteins and we look at the cholesterol fractions and the triglyceride, let's put them on the carrier boat of apolipoproteins. And if this is the apoprotein boat, then on that, what you can clearly see that the HDL is carried by APO1 or APOA. So it's very simple to understand that APOA is a very friendly apolipoprotein because it is carrying the HDL particles. On the other hand, the APOB carries the LDL particle, and obviously it's not a very friendly one. Then you move further, if APOB, which is the bad one, 
combines with ApoA, and on top of that, you have these small particles, that is LP little a, then it becomes extremely dangerous. On the other hand, on the left-hand side, when ApoB combines with VLDL, then of course it is dangerous, but not to the extent as the bottom on the right-hand side. So I hope this boat concept makes you understand that ApoA is the good one, which carries the HDL. ApoB is the bad one, which carries the LDL. And on top of that, if ApoB combines with ApoA1 and also the LP little a, that becomes extremely dangerous. We can look at this in these four simple terminology. What is good? The HDL, as you can see here on the boat of ApoA1. And this is the good one. And when you look at the ApoB100, and then you look at the LDL cholesterol, a small amount of triglyceride as well, and then it is the LDL, and obviously this is the bad one. When you have the B100, and on top of that a bit of triglyceride, a bit of cholesterol, this looks ugly, but may not be as bad as the last one, which I said earlier on, that when you have the ApoB, which is combined with ApoA and lipoprotein little a. So these are extremely simple concepts to understand that what exactly the individual lipid parameters mean to us who are all clinicians and looking at these lipid profile reports every day in our clinical practice. So this deadly lipoprotein little a is the topic of today's discussion this afternoon and this is extremely important and I'll tell you why this is so important. Now, when we look at the values, what are the desirable values? I don't need to tell this audience that it would be much better if the total cholesterol is less than 200. But when it comes to LDL cholesterol, which is dangerous, we are not talking about a single value which is applicable for all the clinical situations. If we have a person who have had a vascular episode in the past and also has underlying diseases like diabetes, etc., then we are talking about an LDL cholesterol target which should be less than 70 milligrams per deciliter. On the other hand, if you are a patient of coronary artery disease, diabetes, but you have not sustained a vascular episode, then you could be doing quite well with an LDL cholesterol of less than 100. Of course, for a normal person, it should be less than 130. Even if you don't have any vascular disease, no diabetes, no hypertension, no history of coronary artery disease, but if your LDL cholesterol is way above 190 milligrams per deciliter, then you are carrying a very high risk for developing vascular episodes in future. On the other hand, what should be the value for the triglycerides? It should preferably be less than 150, and anything more than 200 increases your risk of cerebrovascular or coronary artery disease, but whether that should be a target for treatment remains to be proven, and I'll come to these issues in a minute. HDL, of course, is the other way around. High HDL is protective, and there are different values for males and females, 40 and 50, and that is what should be the target. Why LDL cholesterol is so important is very simple to understand. On the upper panel, what you see, the secondary prevention trial started with the FORES, a Scandinavian trial. These were the patients who already sustained myocardial infarction, and then they were given good doses of a statin treatment, and look at the benefit it was not an ordinary benefit that we are talking about. This was the first medical treatment to reduce the coronary artery disease future incidence. And there was no bottom line here. It is a declining graph. The more aggressively you go on treating, and every single study for secondary prevention with statins showed very remarkable benefit in terms of future prevention of CVD. On the other hand, if you take a cohort, which is from the bottom panel, primary prevention cohort, these patients did not have any vascular disease, did not have a very important comorbidities, and when you treated them, there was a still benefit, but the quantum of benefit was not to the extent that you got in the secondary prevention trial. So these differences are extremely important to understand when you are putting lipid treatment into clinical perspective. Why should we treat dyslipidemias? Obviously, as I said, primary prevention, important, but much more important is the secondary prevention once you have a vascular disease. And particularly, you know, today diabetes is actually considered to be a vascular disease. On top of that, if a diabetic patient sustained a vascular episode, then the risk is much more aggravated. 
So all these things are extremely important. Another very important concept that needs to be understood is the risk calculation. If you are an absolutely asymptomatic person, you do not have any vascular disease, you do not have diabetes, you do not have hypertension, then what is your lifetime risk of developing future coronary artery disease can now be understood by various methods. They are called risk calculators, and you should do that in clinical practice. They are a little cumbersome, but if you make a habit of doing that, then it is eminently possible. I will not go through this very busy slide because the other speaker is definitely going to talk about the secondary prevention and the primary prevention. Suffice it to say that if you do have high-risk patients, like those who have sustained a vascular episode, those who are high-risk patients, in all of them, high-intensity statin treatment is required. There are very few clinical situations where middle-grade intensity or low-intensity statin treatment is instituted. Whereas in the primary prevention trial also, we have many situations where high intensity statin is needed, but in few of them, you can do with low intensity or intermediate intensity in statin treatment. What do we mean by this high intensity and low intensity statin treatment? I think Razuva statin and Atova statin are the only two statins which qualify for this category of high intensity because they have the ability of reducing the LDL cholesterol by more than 50%. And it is 40 to 80 milligrams of atorvastatin and 20 to 40 milligrams of rosuvastatin. All the other statins or the lower doses of atorva and the rosuvastatin come into the category of moderate intensity or low intensity. HDL cholesterol, because of its multiple mechanism of action, time will not permit me to go into the details of them, are actually anti-thrombotic, anti-inflammatory, and they help in the endothelial repair, protect against the oxidative injury to the vascular endothelium, and modulate the endothelial function. And you know if all these effects are there, then obviously it is going to be quite protective to the endothelium. And that will set the stage for lesser and lesser progression of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Low HDL is an independent risk factor what you can clearly see that even if your LDL cholesterol is very low, but if your HDL is low, you can see at the left hand in the bottom, your risk of future CVD and CHD is very, very high. So low HDL is a very important risk factor. But once again, whether that should be a target is quite debatable, and I'll come to that. Let's start with this AIM high study. What is the drug which is available to treat or increase the level of the HDL? The only drug which is available is niacinamide. And in this particular trial, at the bottom, the results are there. There was no significant benefit by using niacinamide. When you look at the another trial, and here the niacinamide was actually combined with lapropripent, and there was no difference once again. So treating HDL with currently available modalities of treatment did not give any benefit in terms of future reduction in the CVD events. What about the non-HDL cholesterol? I talked about the difference between total cholesterol minus HDL cholesterol and all these components, the LDL, VLDL, IDL, and lipoprotein little a combined together constitutes the non-HDL cholesterol. And that becomes a very important therapeutic target and there's very clear correlation of non-HDL cholesterol with single vessel disease, double vessel disease, and triple vessel disease, as you can see, as the level of the non-HDL cholesterol increases, so does the incidence of this multi-vessel coronary artery disease. When you look at this non-HDL cholesterol in the strong heart study, you can clearly see different tertiles, and higher the non-HDL cholesterol, higher is the risk of coronary artery disease. What happens when you compare this with the risk incurred with the LDL cholesterol? Just focus on that. When the LDL cholesterol is more than 100, but the HDL is less than 130, you have the lowest risk. But look at this. LDL less than 100, but non-HDL more than 130, and you carry the highest risk. So obviously, non-HDL cholesterol is a target. Should it be the primary target? No. Primary target should still be the LDL cholesterol. If you have achieved that target, and then the triglyceride is still high, 
Then you calculate the non-HDL cholesterol, which is just add 30 to your LDL target. If LDL target is 100, the non-HDLC target is 130 milligrams per deciliter. So that should be the target, and that should be treated. What about triglycerides? Lot of association of increasing triglyceride with increasing risk of coronary artery disease. But once again, whether it should be treated or not is very debatable because the number of studies which were done actually came out with very negative result of treating triglyceride. But there are studies which also showed benefit of treating triglyceride. And therefore, at this point of time, this is another eicosapentoic acid that actually showed the benefit. So at this point of time, we are a little confused, but we know for sure that if you do treat triglyceride in selected group of patients, that's definitely going to be beneficial, and therefore is this recommendation. The last part of my talk is about this very important issue of lipoprotein little a. Ladies and gentlemen, just imagine a patient who is 55 years old, has sustained a massive myocardial infarction, doesn't have diabetes, hypertension, family history, dyslipidemia, nothing, absolutely nothing. And this patient sustained a massive MI. This is a patient where you must seek a report for lipoprotein little a. And lipoprotein little a is very simple, the LDL particle associated with apoprotein A. And these two, because of the individual pathways, and these pathways are very well established, and these pathways will lead to thrombosis and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and therefore it becomes extremely important. If you have high level of lipoprotein little a, the aortic stenosis also takes an extremely aggressive course. And this is the typical distribution of lipoprotein little a in the general population. Most of the patients would be having a value between 0 to 20. In fact, beyond 50, you seldom see. But if you do have beyond 50, then certainly it becomes an area of concern. If only lipoprotein little a is increased, look at the very, very high risk that you have for future vascular disease. And unfortunately, if lipoprotein little a is combined with type 2 diabetes, then look at the very stupendous risk of developing future cardiovascular disease. This is extremely important target. And what happens when you have pa patients who have actually this lipoprotein little a value of more than 50, and they are already being treated with a high dose of a statin, and you still see a very high risk of coronary artery disease. So in all such patients who have premature coronary artery disease, familial hypercholesterolemia, family history, recurrent CVD, and all these risk factors, you must estimate the lipoprotein little a. And when you do th this type of screening, the possibility of picking up lipoprotein little a related risk is very, very high, 1 in 2.4. If you do a systematic screening, even if you do an opportunistic screening, you pick up 1 in 5.8. And similarly, the yield of elevated LPA, more than 50, and plus familial hypercholesterolemia, you very much increase the risk of possibly getting high-risk individuals. And you can see here, if you combine the two risk factors together, the family history of hypercholesterolemia and increased level of lipoprotein little a, that's the kind of risk that you are talking about, and this is extremely dangerous. Is there any treatment beyond lifestyle modification? Statins actually don't work. They will reduce the LDLC, but do not reduce the lipoprotein little a. Niacinamide is one agent which can reduce the lipoprotein little a, but look at that figure, 30 to 40% reduction in the level of lipoprotein little a. And when you do clinical trials with niacinamide, they do not give you the clinical outcome benefit, no vascular benefit. So then came the plasma apheresis. But the entire scenario completely changed with the availability of PCSK9 inhibitors, which have revolutionized the treatment of this severe degree of dyslipidemia. And why it has become so important now? Because these molecules are now available in your therapeutic armamentarium. And there are two of them, the mipomersin and the PCSK9 inhibitor. However, the biggest challenge is that we don't know how much they should be reduced. If somebody comes to you with a value of 124 of lipoprotein little a, how much will give the benefit? We, we saw that the 35 to 40 percent reduction with niacinamide did not translate into any clinical benefit. And therefore, what we need to understand that what quantum of reduction of LDL cholesterol gives the vascular benefit. And this we know for the last 30 years. If you reduce LDL cholesterol by 38.67 milligrams, 
you reduce the vascular events by 22% if you do a five-year study. So we take that as the benchmark, just one minute, sir, and then go into this very interesting, very modern, what we call Mendelian randomization analysis. And this is possible because lipoprotein A is completely a genetic disorder, polygenic inheritance. Environment plays absolutely no role into the levels of lipoprotein little a. And therefore, we have the genome-wise association studies in certain countries of the Europe, and five such studies have pooled almost 17,000 patients, 13,000 patients. And all those 13,000 patients were actually taken and 27 SNPs were identified, single nucleotide polymorphism, and their correlation with lipoprotein little a values were taken. And when that was analyzed into the data, it was found that to get 22% reduction in vascular events, you need to reduce lipoprotein little a by 65.7 milligrams per deciliter. Now we understand why niacinamide failed, because niacinamide could not give you this amount of reduction in the lipoprotein little a. And therefore, on the basis of this Mendelian randomization, we can set up future clinical trials with PCSK9 inhibitors or the future therapeutic agents which should achieve this degree of lipoprotein little a reduction, and then we will be able to make an impact in reducing the vascular diseases. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like to conclude that lipid abnormalities are very important risk factors. They must be done for the risk categorization. LDL should always remain the target. And when we talk about the secondary prevention, it is very, very effective. In primary prevention also, it is very effective. When a statins fail, then you can move on to using agents like ezetimibe or PCSK9 inhibitor. PCSK9 inhibitors are not frequently available, are extremely expensive. This needs to be understood. HDL, though it is a target, but we don't have any modality except exercise. Non-HDL is an important goal, only to be targeted once LDL goal has been met. And finally, triglyceride does not need to be treated alone. But if it is more than 500 milligram to prevent pancreatitis, rather than to prevent coronary artery disease, you must use fibrates. And finally, lipoprotein little a has emerged as a very, very strong risk factor for future vascular disease. And it should be actively sought during your workup of a patient suspected to have coronary artery disease. Thank you very much for your kind attention.